we just had this music we talked about that we are the church, that we ought to shake, shake, shake with so much yeah. excitement, so filled with the Spirit. Look, Sparky's yeah. shaking. Who's, woo. Woo, woo, woo. Yeah. We ought to be shaking. The cross has made us flawless. Yeah. You, I hope you believe all the things we just sang. Yeah. You do? Yeah. You believe it? All right, so do I. It's it's incredible, I, and I'm really glad to be here. My wife Grace and I we we are just a few years out of Mormonism. Gosh, we just we we just can't imagine anybody being changed like we were changed. But the thing is, when I hear other people's stories, when I hear your story and your story and your story, I realize we're all on the same wheel. You know, we're like spokes on a wheel, and. Our objective is to get to the center, to get to the hub, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. So ultimately, your story and my story is the same. We, we don't really have a church. We travel around with a ministry and we do little things. and So it's, it's kind of cool because, because I can come here and I can stand in rough spot for one Sunday. I can just offend everyone, tick you off, and I won't see you for months. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's my objective here today. Uh, but just... So maybe I won't do that. Let's pray. Can we pray? Our dear God, it's, it's amazing, God, what you do in our lives. It's incredible for us to stand back and watch you change us, cause us to be something we never imagined we could be, filled with your Spirit, Lord, literally shaking with the power of the Spirit. We are changed. And inside, even if we're shy and we don't shake very well on the outside for people to say, God, we're We're quivering on the inside, filled with your spirit. And God, we desire to always be shaking. We pray, God, that that you will lead this discussion, that it won't be my sermon, that I will get out of the way and let you do your work. And Father, I'm standing in Rev's spot because he can't be here today. This isn't my place to be, it's his. And and God, we pray that you will, we know you can heal him if you will. We know sometimes that's not what you do. Sometimes you have a different plan. We know that Paul, he had an an affliction in his flesh. We don't know what that was, God, but we know that it troubled him all of his life. And yet we know that you strengthened him, lifted him, directed him, and made him such a powerful cause for the kingdom. We pray that, that you will do the same for Rev. God, whatever it is that you plan, God, we pray that he will be able to soon enter the fight and be part of part of your work. Now, God, lead us this day. Fill us with your spirit. Let us carry it out to the world when we're done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to talk today about, um, you know, some of the things we sang about. We sang about we are the church. We sang about being made perfect by the cross. We sang about all of the, the really awesome things that happened in the early church. I want you to think about what happened in the early church. I mean, they went crazy and the church just grew everywhere. And, and I wonder sometimes if we're letting it get a little bit stagnant here and we're not stepping out like we ought to do. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to mostly focus in Acts, and I hope you have your Bibles. But if you do, don't open Acts yet because we're going to start somewhere else, but we'll get there. Soon enough. (laughs) We're actually going to start in Leviticus because that is where we can really confuse people. So let's start there because Leviticus is kind of a crazy book with its with its own weird. Well, I don't know weird. It's it's God's way. You know, God's way is higher than ours, and so we read it. If we don't understand, it's probably because because we're not understanding God. Let's see if we can understand at least a little piece of what He has to say. We are in Leviticus chapter fourteen. This is a section that talks about cleansing the leper. As we talk about the leper, I would like you to strike the word leper and insert sin. Because that's really what this is about, is it's about cleansing us of those things that are most likely to destroy us. And that's sin more than anything. Right, guys? So, let's begin. We're going to begin in verse 12, and I'm just going to read this to you, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. Because it is a little bit strange. And it says... And the priest shall take one of the male lambs. Now the leper who wants to be cleansed, he's brought two lambs to the high priest. So he'll take one of the lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with 
the log of oil. Now, a log is just a unit of measure. It's like a pint or a quart or an ounce. I don't know how big it is, but it's a unit of measure. So with a log of oil, and he shall kill the lamb in the place there and kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary. Now, this is the part I want you to pay attention to. So we have two sacrifices. We have we have a burnt offering. The burnt offering is the lamb that's going to be burnt on the altar. Now, does burning cleanse? Can we cleanse things with fire? Get rid of weeds and canker and you know, we sure can. So, so we have the burnt offering, but we also have the sin offering. And the, the sin offering is for cleansing us, for sanctifying us, making us whole after we've scraped away, burnt off all the crud. So that's where we're going to begin. So the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of the right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the oil and pour it into his left palm, and he'll take some of it, and he sprinkles it seven times, and then he puts the oil over the top of the blood on the right ear, the right thumb, the right toe. And he takes what's left, and he puts it on the head of the man who is wanting to be healed of his what? Of his... La- no, not leprosy. It's sin. But the point I want to make here is, well, with the blood... He took the blood of one of the offerings, and he put it on the right ear, and he put it on the right thumb, and he put it on the right toe. He put the blood of the lamb on the right ear to cleanse us from the things we hear. Put it on the right thumb to cleanse us of the things we do. Put it on the right toe to cleanse us from the places we go that we ought not go. But the cool thing here is what came first, the blood or the oil? The blood. He put the blood on the ear, on the thumb, on the foot. But then the oil represents the Holy Spirit. The oil is is an anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so first we have to be cleansed by the blood. Then the Holy Spirit can pour in and wash over us and make us clean and renew us, change us to something new. So it's interesting because Moses, back in the beginning, knew about this. Now let's change, open our books, our Bibles. We're going to go to Matthew 3. Because John the Baptist knew the same thing that Moses knew. So we're going to go to Matthew 3. We're going to start in verse 11. Now this is when John the Baptist, he was baptizing the people. And everybody was coming out of the cities to see this crazy man who uh, he, he wore a camel skin coat, right? As near as we know about his diet, he probably still had grasshoppers in his beard. This crazy man out there baptizing people. And the Pharisees came and he called them a brood of vipers. And then in, in verse 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Same thing that Moses said thousands of years earlier. He's going to baptize us with the blood, the fire, to burn away our sin, and then he's going to anoint us with oil to sanctify us, that we may become, what did that say? Change, change, change? Something like that in the song? So that we can be changed. So good old John the Baptist, he knew about that. Now, you're not going to believe it, but I'm going to let you turn to Acts. <laughs> we'll get there. I told you we'd get there. Acts chapter 1. So who wrote Acts? Luke. Luke. Luke wrote Acts. Luke knew it too. Luke knew it too, and he wrote in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he said to the disciples, you see, Jesus has, has come. He spent 40 days with the disciples, preparing them to lead the church on their own, and then he's gone back up into heaven. He's ascended into heaven. And they're standing there, and they don't know what to do. But his last instruction to them, he said, wait for the promise. There's already been blood on the cross, right? He has already shed his blood for us. That fire 
has been there to burn us clean, to burn away the, the skank and the stink and the sin. And he says, wait for the promise. And we go on and we read, you heard from me from John, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, the oil. See, there's this amazing continuity. It starts from Moses and it goes all the way through to the end of the Bible. So anyway, Luke knew it too. And now we're going to talk about what does that look like? What does it look like when the promise comes and we are... What? Ah. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) We're, We're going to take a look at what it looks like when the promise comes, the Spirit, the oil, the holy oil of God, the Spirit fills us, immerses us, and lives in our heart. See, it can't get into our heart until we first burn away the the crud, right? We have to burn away the crud to get to the inside, and he pours that, that oil of the Spirit into us. <sighs> so anyway, we're going to take a look at what that looks like. But first, we want to take a look at Peter. I'm going to pick on Peter a lot for a little bit. Is that okay? You see, Peter was kind of a screw-up, you know, <sighs> which doesn't make him that much different than us. Anybody here not a screw-up? We got one. We have one perfect person in the room. Everybody, touch her. You know, let some of it rub off. <laughs> uh, Peter was kind of a screw up. It was Peter that took two or three steps on the water, and then he started to sink, and he cried out, "Save me!" You remember? And and Jesus reached down, and took him by the hand, and lifted him up. Peter, the screw up, not unlike you and I. Yeah. It was Peter who we read about in Matthew 16. He was going with Jesus, and they were going back to Jerusalem. Jesus knew why he was going. He knew that he was going to go there, that he was going to be betrayed, that he would fall into the hands of his enemies, that he would hang on the cross for our sins. I don't think he wanted to go, but he knew that it's something he needed to do because of what? Because of what? Love. Unbelievable. Selfless love. He was going to go and do that no matter what. And so he told Peter to screw up. He said, Peter, I'm going to go and they're going to take me and they're going to kill me. And Peter said, no. Peter loved Jesus. He said, there is not a chance that I will let that happen. This is in Matthew 16. And we're reading uh, starting at verse 12. No, 21. I'm sorry. Dyslexia gets me sometimes. So Peter's saying, no, that's not going to happen. He says, I will stand with you. I will I will fight for you. I will defend you. I will not let them take you. He says, he says I, I got your back. You don't have to worry that this is going to happen. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So Peter doesn't want Jesus to go to the yeah. cross. Who... Even more than Peter doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Who wants Jesus to go to the cross less than anybody else? Satan does not want Jesus to go to the cross. Mm -hmm. He knows that it is on the cross and rising from the grave that he will be destroyed. He knows that Satan doesn't want it. And so he turned to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, can you think of what that was like for Peter? He's like, oh. That man must have killed him. Get behind me, Satan. And then he, he goes on in verse 23 of Matthew 16. He says, you are a hindrance to me. Man, does it, did, did, did any of you want to hear Jesus say to you, get behind me, Satan? You are a hindrance to me. Your mind is on things, uh, or is not on things of God, but on things of man. See, Peter is still Peter the screw up. But there's, there's something amazing about Peter. He loved Jesus no matter what. Nothing could separate him from Jesus. We go just a, a, a few weeks or months forward, and we see Peter standing in the courtyard in Jerusalem, and he denies Jesus again and again and again. And at one point, a little girl, a tiny no. young girl comes up and says, aren't no. you one of Jesus' disciples. And this little girl drove him back. He was afraid of this tiny little girl. Peter, the screw-up, 
was just getting his butt kicked by this little girl. And he denied no. Jesus the third time. <sighs> just like we do. You ever deny Jesus? Maybe not in words. Are there things you do when, when you act in a certain way that tells the world, I don't really believe? I lack faith in Jesus. You see, we, we're not all that different. And so this is, this is Peter the screw up, but I want to introduce you to another Peter. Finally, we can turn to Acts. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to turn to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to begin there. We, we Actually, we already started that. We talked about, about how Luke knew the same thing that Moses knew and knew the same thing that John the Baptist knew. But before we go on, I have to share a story because my wife and I, we're not even quite two years out of Mormonism. You go back three years, I'm a high priest in the Mormon church. I'm a leader. Man, my shirt was wider than anybody's. And so I was cool. One one day we, we knew we needed more. And so we, we literally laid everything we loved to the foot of the cross. We went to God and we said, you know what? You take our home, our lands, our cars, our jobs. You take our friends. And God, if it's necessary, even take our children. We have got to know the truth. Amen. And so we started to pray. And then we opened the Bible and we started reading in Matthew. And I was speaking at a church down in Ogden recently, and the pastor said, well, when you started reading the Bible for the first time, which passage grabbed you, and by which passage were you converted? And I said, Matthew chapter 1. And he said, no way. Not a chance that that would ever happen, because do you guys know what's in Matthew chapter 1? It's the genealogy of Jesus. For me, at that time in my life, it was just a giant list of names I couldn't even pronounce. And yet... I was converted in that instant. Why? Because I surrendered to Jesus and I gave him everything. Amen. And so I didn't know anything more than I knew before. And as we continued to read, we learned that we still didn't know anything. We got to Acts, which we're going to read now. And we got to Acts chapter 2. And it says, <laughs> then the day of Pentecost arrived. And, and I remember that night we were, we were sitting up in our bed and we were taking turns reading and Grace was reading and she started to read this. I said, stop! Stop, stop, stop. Before you read any further, tell me everything you know about Day of Pentecost. And she went, um, I've heard of it. (laughs) Um, I think it's something the Catholics do. (laughs) You see, she didn't know, and I didn't know anymore. This is the birthday of the church. This is, this is the, the event that turned Loser Peter into amazing Peter. And, uh, and that's right. It did. And so we're going to talk about what happens when the Spirit flows. We know that at that particular time, there were 120 disciples of Jesus, and they were locked up in a house, and the doors were locked because they were afraid. They lacked the boldness, the courage to stand up and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. The doors were locked. And at that particular time, Pentecost is a festival. And so there were people from all different lands that came in all over the place. Jerusalem was filled with people. And so these 120 disciples are in the house and they start to hear. But it's getting louder. They hear this wind. And they're looking around and going, wow. And all the people in Jerusalem are going, what in the world? And then this tongue of fire, whatever it was, it came into the house. And and it says it came in like a tongue of fire and it parted. And it went this way and this way and that way. And it it went into people. It went into Sean and it went into this this man, whoever his name is, whatever his name is. It went in. It just went everywhere. Bang, 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 bang. They're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it was incredible. And, and, and because of the sound of the wind, Jerusalem's all coming to this house. Everybody, all these people from all these foreign lands who speak all these foreign languages are coming and they're standing outside the house and they are all hearing the gospel preached in their own language. And they say, how can this be? It's a bunch of Galileans. Uh, Galileans are just a bunch of country hill billies. I mean, that's really who they were. They were kind of the hill country people. They could barely speak their own tongue, let alone everything else. And yet, all these people are hearing 
the word of God in their own language. And they thought, <laughs> must be a biker church, you know? They're probably, <laughs> they're probably all just drunk. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because we, this is where we see who Peter became when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The coward who couldn't walk on water, the coward who didn't believe Jesus, the coward that was afraid of a little girl. Suddenly he comes, he comes out and he says, what they are hearing is the prophecy of Joel. Now we're in Acts 2, starting in verse 17. Peter speaking, he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even my male servants and my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And when I read this for the first time, I said, oh, that's why I never learned this in the Mormon church. Women, sons and daughters, daughters prophesying. Oh, not there. Not there. So I understood why it had been kept from me. But this is this is Peter, and he's super, super bold. And then a few days later, we move to Acts 3. And it's pretty cool. Peter and John are going to the temple. And on their way to the temple, they see a man... He's been lame for birth, and every day his family takes him in and sets him by the gate so that he can beg for alms. And everybody knows that he's been lame from birth, and he's been that way for many, many, many years. And Peter and John come by, and uh, and the man asks for alms, and Peter says, verse 6, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And then something really cool happened. Peter reached down and he took the man's hand and lifted him to his feet. Where did Peter first see that? Where did Peter first see that happen? It was on the sea. Peter was sinking to his death and Jesus bent low, took him by the hand, and lifted him up. Peter is now starting to act more and more like Jesus in everything he does. That's the power of the Spirit, and it's just incredible. So anyway, you know, no, uh, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Isn't that the way it works? And so this man, he, he began running around the temple, and he's, he's, just, he's excited. He's leaping and jumping on legs that never leapt and jumped before. And he's so excited. And the Jews all said, hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. We can't have this kind of crap going on here. So they asked, how did this happen? And Peter said that it was by the power of Jesus Christ that they see this man leaping and jumping on his, on his feet. This is Peter. Now he's talking to the Jews. Now who are the Jews? We have to remember who these people were. They were the people who a few months ago, were waving palms and shouting Hosanna as Jesus rode into the city on the colt, right? Many of them were. And this is the same people that a short time later were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. These are the people of Jerusalem that did this thing. And so Peter the loser is now Peter the awesome, and he says, you... I mean, he, he probably picked out the biggest man in the crowd. He said, you, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> you killed the author of life. This is the boldness of Peter. You killed the author of life. He laid it right on them. And he goes on, he says, by faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus was given this man Perfect hell in the presence of you all. And then here's the really cool thing. The religion that I used to live in says that if you shed innocent blood, that which, which includes abortion, murder, all those things, if you shed innocent blood, there is no forgiveness for you in this life or the life to come. And Peter is so cool, he just called them murderers. You killed the author of life. Whoa. And then in verse 19, he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. He's offering them forgiveness. And why not? Because Jesus hung on the cross, right? They're driving nails through his hands, through his feet, which was painful, but even more so 
Our sins were being driven through his heart because it says he took our sins with him to the cross to be knelt there through his heart. And that was the most painful part. And so as they did that to him, as we did that to him, he cried out to the Father, forgive them. So if God says that the murderers of God himself can be forgiven, then these people can be forgiven. And so can everyone else. If we want to just trust Jesus. So anyway, we start to see the power of Peter. <laughs> like I said, no one, no good deed goes unpunished. And so if we jump down to chapter 4, we see that Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, brought before the council, brought before the crazy, crooked, goofy bunch of, bunch of Pharisees. And they talked to Peter and John about where they got their authority. And, and I love Peter and John's answer. It says in verse 18 of chapter 4, it says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all of Jesus. See, they got a gag order. This is a gag order. You cannot speak of Jesus anymore. Not here. Not in all of Israel. Do not even try. Shut your mouth and keep it shut. And Peter, Peter the awesome now, right? Peter the awesome, he says, Whether it is right in the sight of God, to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Nobody's pushing Peter around anymore. He is filled with this amazing power. <laughs> Bless his heart, he just kept doing what he does. And it wasn't long before they saw him again on the Temple Mount teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they grabbed him up and they threw him in jail, in prison. And an angel came that night, and let him out. Angels are cool. If you don't have a friend that's an angel, you ought to make one because they're just handy in times like this. And so, so an, an angel came and let him out. And I love this next part. See, the council, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they went to the prison the next day. The cell's empty. Where are they? And then yeah. they're looking around and they're going, man, where? And, and the way this passage reads, there's one guy and he goes, look! Look, they're back on the Temple Mount teaching Jesus again. So they drug him in. They drug him in before the council again. And they said, chapter 5, verse 28, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, and yet here you have filled Jerusalem with all your teachings. Wouldn't that be awesome? What if we did that? What if we filled Pocatello? with the word of God. I mean, in every ear. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, yeah who wants to do that? I, th- I just think that would be awesome. Yeah. And, and they said, you know, why, why are you doing this? We jump down to verse 29. Or, yeah, 29. And Peter answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, pointing to the big guy in the room again, right? (laughs) Whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we have witness to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. We are seeing we are seeing the promise that was first prophesied and typified by Moses and talked about by Peter and mentioned again by Luke. Now we're, we're seeing it played out. The part I love is they didn't know what to do. This, this Peter and John are starting to be a real big problem, right? And so they said, let's just kill them. It wouldn't be, I mean, if we just kill him, the problem's gone. And one of the Pharisees, I don't know which one, Gamaliel, he says, you know what? They just healed the man on the Temple Mount in front of many Jews. They're offering forgiveness to all these people. If you kill them, the people, are, there's going to be such an uprising. And so they said, okay, we'll just take him in the back and we'll beat him up real good. And we'll turn him loose. And I love... I love what happened next. Verse 40, chapter 5. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. 
Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease in teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. And so I, I love the example of Peter, and I'd kind of like to wrap it up by turning to the last chapter of Matthew. You know, Jesus Jesus died, he was resurrected, he spent 40 days with those people that, that loved him. This is the last counsel. This is the last thing he wanted those people to know. And so if you're going to be separated from people you love, and you can only say one thing to them, one uh, last thing, is it going to be something flaky or is it going to be something uh, critically important? It's going to be amazing. So this is what Jesus said to those people. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go therefore. Okay, go therefore. See what he's saying. This authority is given to me, but I have now given it to you through the Holy Spirit. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, we are not talking about water baptisms. When you were baptized into a church, it's a man baptizing a man. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Moses talked about, that John talked about, that Luke talked about. It's the baptism that changes us, makes us new, makes us something we never, we never thought we could be, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I would like to suggest to you is this calls us all, calls every one of us. Now, I don't know what your ministry is. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. But God does. And I would suggest to you that you should find out. You should ask God, where do you want me to be? How do you want me to, to yeah. work in the kingdom? But the thing is, I think it's got to go beyond the end of this pew and beyond those doors and get out in the street, just like Peter and John did. They were preaching day to day on the temple and house to house that Jesus is the Christ. I think that's what we need to do. And so now I'm going to shift gears from my my sermon, and I'm going to put in a shameless plug for our ministry, because I'd like to invite you to join us. We have had amazing experiences. Like I said, we've been out of the church for a year and a half, a little over that now. Before I left, I got the same gag order that Peter and John got. When I violated that gag order, they tried to have me arrested. When I continued to violate it, they hauled me into court. Just two months ago, I was in criminal court in a jury trial. Charges dismissed. But they were trying to put me in jail for six months. And this is what, this is what the Sanhedrin has always done. And why? Because we have had Beautiful experiences. Grace and I went down to Manti, Utah. Anybody, everybody know where that is? Yeah. Central Utah. Every summer they have a pageant. It's on a it's on a steep hillside with the Manti Temple sitting on top of the hill. Whoa. Twenty thousand Mormons come over two weeks. Yeah. See that? For two weeks, from six o'clock to nine o'clock, we fish. And we, and we hook, we hook Mormons, and then we hand the pole to Christ. And I would like to share a couple of stories of what happened down there. There was one woman, I went up to her one night, and, and she was real instantly defensive. She, oh, stay away from me, uh, you know, I, 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 don't do that, that's the cross, you know, you don't want to be messing with that. But she was, my family, I'm fifth generation Mormon, my family came here in handcarts. No, 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 I'm not interested. And I just said, oh, would you meet with me privately tomorrow? And she said, yes. God is so cool. And I went in and I sat in her office and with the door closed so no one else could listen, she opened her heart and her walls started falling down and she talked about all the corruption and the hurtful things and the people that she has seen destroyed. And I went, wow. It was amazing. There was another couple, a young couple, in their early 20s, I would guess. They came down to see the pageant. And just before the pageant starts, they play over the loudspeaker so a whole town can hear Amazing Grace. 
And that is the signal. When that happens, the people that came to see the pageant go get their seats. Yeah. And the people that came to minister to them, we all go to this hamburger joint so we can have a Coke, eat a burger, and, you know, compare notes. And, and I didn't make the initial contact with these young people. A couple of uh, college girls that drove in from Louisiana to do this talk to them. And it's amazing. The furthest person that came in last year was from Malaysia. Flew all the way from Malaysia to witness to these people. So anyway, this couple talked to this these two college girls, and they heard Amazing Grace, and the couple said, well, or the girl said, well, I, it was nice talking to you. And they, and they started heading off to the hamburger joint. And the couple, they went, they looked at the temple, and they, they looked back at these girls, and they looked at the Whoa. temple, and looked back at the girls, and they followed the girls. It was amazing. So I'm sitting there eating my hamburger, and I noticed these girls talking to this couple out in the parking lot. One of the girls came in and said, Lance, neither one of us been more, have ever been Mormon. They need to talk to someone who's been in and out. They need, to, they need some help dealing with some of the challenges that they're facing. I, I sat on the sidewalk and talked to them for hours. And it is such a beautiful thing. You see, he's, he has made the leap. He's now a Christian. She is one foot in and one foot out. And, I, and we still talk to them every once in a while. You know, we just kind of stay in touch. And God is so good. God is so amazing. So here's the plug. Next week, right here at 6 o'clock, we will do a training, and we will continue to do those trainings every month. You see, you can't help people that are lost unless you know why they're lost. And so next week, we're going to talk about the number one thing. See, Joseph Smith's most amazing win, you know, I boing, put that one up on the scoreboard, was when he convinced all the people that the Bible couldn't be trusted. Yeah. And so next week, we're what? going to actually present evidence yeah. from manuscripts, from the Word of God, that what? What, what the Mormon people believe isn't yeah. true. Because you see... If they don't believe they can trust the Bible, what am I going to appeal to them with? And so we have to teach them that they can believe this Bible. And so that's where we start. And we have ongoing things all the time. We prepare you. We give you handouts. We give you trifold tracks that you can give to your friends. And you, if you need more, you can just go to our website and download them, print them. So but anyway, they're available to you to use all the time. Like I said, I don't know. I don't have any idea if our ministry is to be yours. But I do believe that God wants you to be working in his kingdom some way. And so I invite you to come and join with us next week, 6 o'clock, right here. And uh, wow. and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll begin. And then we have, several, yeah. we have several mission trips that we're putting together. We will go down to Manti. We'll be there for two weeks. You can come down for all two weeks if you want. It's really cool. We have a tent city in the park. It's like the invasion uh, of the Mormon snatchers. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have we have this tent city, and it, it's so much fun. The the lady from Malaysia she can't afford to fly in unless we let her prepare our meals for us every night. And so she prepares a meal and she feeds all the Christians. It's five dollars a plate. And, and people come from people come from Texas and New Mexico and I had one girl I needed a ride back to back to the park where we were all sleeping one night and she said I'll give you a ride and she was maybe 26 27 she's a young girl and she drove all the way from Kansas by herself and so we walked up to her car and I looked at that piece of crap and I thought I wouldn't trust that thing to cross the road and she drove all by herself from Kansas how to love for these people. <laughs> Sparky's pointing to the source. He just keeps it going. It's amazing. We, we as Christians, we go down there. We meet every morning at the local Christian church. We worship together. We get a little training on how we can talk to Mormons without offending them. And then at night at 6 o'clock, we meet at this intersection that's blocked off, surrounded by thousands of Mormon people. And they hear us sing and praise, and worship, and then we break up. And those people that can, that feel like it's what God's given them, they go out and they talk to people. And my wife, bless her heart, she's a little bit more shy. Those that don't feel like they can go and actually get into a conversation, they form teams of prayer warriors. 
And so every time I'm talking to a couple or anyone else is talking to a couple, all you have to do is look over your shoulder and there'll be four or five or six people just praying their hearts out that God will give me words, that God will give them a heart to hear. And because of that, we just have an amazing time. So that's it. Six o'clock next week. We would love to have you join us. Yeah. And even if you don't feel like you want to go on the mission trips, we will give you tools and ideas that you can put in your toolbox just to talk to your friends and neighbors right here. Let's pray. Dear God, oh, you're so amazing, God. It's We can't believe that we can actually go before you in confidence, that we can have confidence yeah. in your in your love, that we can have confidence that, that at the cross has made us perfect in your sight and that the, 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 the perfection, the worthiness, the holiness of Christ is imputed to us. God, we are so grateful for all these things. God, we pray that you will give us courage to find out where we belong in your kingdom and to work to bring the good word of Jesus Christ to the hearts and the ears of of everyone around us. This we pray for in Jesus' name. And, and God, again, we lift up Rev. God, yeah. we pray that, that your will in his life will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.